for those of you who came on time, we're going to start pretty much on time. And I'd like to, uh, Doug to come to the stage, please, uh, to do the opening. Wahi. Uh, mai i te moana, e rere ana, ka tangi te tītī. Uh, mai i te ngāhere, e katakata ana, ka tangi te kākā. Uh, mai i te tuāhu nei, ko toku reo tēnei, e tangi ana ki a ia te kaihanga o ngā mea katoa, a tīhei mauri ora. Uh, tuatahi ki a rātou, kua wehe atu ki te pō, ngā mate, haere atu koutou, Haere, haere, haere. Haere atu koutou, ki te kainga tūturu a te tangata ki tu o pairau, ki te oki oki ngā tūturu, te wāhi kei runga i ngā rangi, arā ko te kainga a ihu karaiti. A kahuri a, a hau ki a tātou katoa, a ngā hunga ora, a nau mai, hara mai, whakatau mai ki tēnei hui, a he hui whakahira hira tēnei e pāna ki ngā mahi o te pāmu, a nau mai, hara mai, koutou katoa, ngā rangatira a, o tēnei a tū momo mahi. A he mahi tāonga tēnei a, mō tātou katoa ngā tangata o tēnei whenua o Aotearoa. <coughs> a... He honore tino nui tēnei ki a hau ki te tui mui a koutou i tēnei wā. Uh, hei kai korero tuatahi mō tēnei hui. Uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā rau atu tātou katoa. Tātua, te whakapono. Me te rangi marie, tātou, tātou e. Um, thank you very much. Just a quick uh, interpretation and assistance to change that into English. Um, I just opened there with a uh, sort of traditional opening, uh, utilising um, some old poetry uh, from that the old people used to use and acknowledged uh, the importance of the conference, uh, the importance of the red meat sector to New Zealand, and also acknowledged um, everybody here uh, and the minds and the value, et cetera, that everybody brings. So it's a great honour to have been able to do that uh, to open this conference. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, welcome to Christchurch and the Red Meat Sector Conference 2019. Uh, first up, housekeeping. Uh, toilets are located on this floor in the far right-hand corner, and there are more toilets in the ground floor lobby if needed. Uh, they're near the restaurant. In the case of fire, you'll hear the fire alarm, and, a and in a calm manner, please leave the building via the stairs, and, and the assembly point is in the main car park just outside main reception. Please do not use the lifts or try to go back to your room if there's a fire alarm going. In the case of an earthquake, please drop cover and hold, and if we need to evacuate, the hotel staff will direct you to the assembly point. Uh, these are no smoking premises. There is a smoking area on the ground floor outside the building near the conference entrance. Uh, please also ensure that you've turned your mobile phones to silent. Uh, if anybody's rings, they can be expected to support the uh, uh, wine sponsor by making a contribution to the costs of alcohol. <laughs> um, as you may have noticed, not only do we have our own team members taking photos of the conference today, but we have a number of media in attendance too. Uh, while the media will primarily be getting photos and video footage of today's speakers, Please aware, be aware that you may appear in crowd shots or similar background footage. Uh, I'd also like to thank all our sponsors who helped make the Red Meat Sector Conference possible. Our gold sponsors are Ag Research and Russell McVeigh. Silver sponsors are Q Cons and Wiley. Um, Hamburg Sud for last night's cocktails and Maersk for the gala dinner tonight. And all the other sponsors and sponsors who provided support for this conference.
Uh, I urge you to go to the trade stands during the breaks. Unfortunately, the trade stands are not uh, easy to, to find the downstairs through the area, area where breakfast is, uh, but the sponsors have been big supporters of us and we'd like you to make the effort to be support, supportive of them and to uh, seek them out. There's a program of today's conference on your lanyard so you can follow what's happening and the speakers will have time for questions after their presentations. Please make sure that if you're asking a question, you're asking a question, not making a statement, as we need to keep a very tight ship today to keep to time. Um, the final housekeeping thing I want to mention is that we're going to use an innovative way to ask questions today. For question time, we're going to be using catch boxes for asking questions. These work the same as a microphone, except they're specific, specifically designed to be passed around the room instead of handed at a microphone. They're light and soft, uh, here's one of them here, that I prepared earlier. Um, uh, uh, they're light and soft and they won't break. Uh, once you catch it, please speak into it and everybody in the room will be able to hear you. Uh, uh, Matt and John Ladley will demonstrate one of them. So. Where's Matt? Kia ora. <laughs> My name is Matt, and that's actually the best pass you've ever thrown. <laughs> uh, um, uh, they are for uh, speakers. They are not used to wake sleeping delegates. <laughs> um, we do ask, still ask you to raise your hand to ask a question and wait from the, to the go-ahead from the section, session chair, and our staff will pass or throw a microphone to you. Now that I've got... Uh, uh, the formalities out of the way, I just wanted to make a few comments uh, to set the scene before we get into presentations for the day. Uh, this year the primary sector is facing challenges on a number of fronts. On climate change the government is pushing ahead at speed. The government, in its own words, wants this to be a year of delivery and climate change is, quote, the challenge of our generation. This haste and at times a lack of transparency has caused challenges for MIA, beef and lamb and others in the sector. Those challenges have been amplified by zealots of various types filling the airways with their opinions. First, the Carbon Zero Bill is currently before Parliament. Most of the bill is common sense and we as a sector are completely up for playing our part in a sensible response to climate change. But the size of the methane target came as a huge surprise to us and has all the hallmarks of a messy political compromise. The methane targets in the bill are not credible. Uh, MIA commissioned independent scientific analysis on the methane targets from University of Oxford, which confirmed how much the methane targets in the bill are just not supported by good science. Worse, the current, on current technology, the methane targets in the bill would inflict enormous damage on the sector. The only way to achieve the unnecessarily steep reductions in methane in the, carbon, in the zero carbon bill is by reducing livestock, with a flow on impact into meat processing and onto regional communities and the wider New Zealand economy. The Beef and Lamb Economic Service is undertaking analysis which will show the significant impact on farmers' incomes from the methane targets. The Zero Carbon Bill also calls for carbon dioxide to go to net zero by 2050. We have grave concerns at the long-term impacts on the pastoral sector if fossil fuel emitters can offset their emissions by buying land and planting it in pine forest. This issue is complex, but it needs to be considered in a comprehensive, measured way. The other climate change issue is how we reduce agricultural emissions. Uh, there are two options. The first is that the government to, to do it to us through the emissions trading scheme. To be absolutely clear, we strongly oppose this. The cost of the emissions trading scheme will become crushing if the carbon price increases and if the free allocation a government subsidy is lowered by future governments. The other option is the United Primary Sector Climate Change Commitment. The commitment details a practical five-year programme of action aimed at on-farm changes. Importantly, we accept that by 2025, farmers will individually pay 
a price on their emissions. But that price is set to real, encourage realistic changes and the uptake of available technologies. And fa for farmers who are doing the right things and significantly reducing their emissions should not pay. But negotiating sensible practical legislation around climate change is only the first step for us. In reality, we're creating a window for our sector to respond in. The response itself is critically important. The quality of our response will be important in how we are judged by affluent global consumers. We need to move from a compliance mindset to an opportunity mindset and to tell a story, a great story as rural environmentalists. This can be the basis of building future premiums into the values of our products, but we cannot do this without a sensible legislative framework, but that framework is only the start. We also need to recognise that climate change is representative of a bigger issue. While the pastoral sector is the biggest money earner for New Zealand Inc, despite this, the media often portrays the sector as backwards and polluting. The reality is we are a progressive sector. We're critical to the prosperity and wealth of the country's economy, we're the second largest goods exporter and New Zealand's largest manufacturing industry. We've also been an enormous driver of productivity right through our sector. It's fashionable to look at the uh, rural sector at the moment in terms of the environmental impact, but another obvious but largely ignored reality is the environmental degra degradation emanating from our cities. And as a nation, we can't overlook that either. <coughs> our in our primary sector, we have world-leading, innovative, high-tech, complex production and manufacturing businesses uh, on farm and beyond the farm gate, producing food for global consumers, which are delivering real and tangible benefits to regional New Zealand and the wide economy. Kneecapping the primary primary sector would ultimately kneecap our national ability to provide well-being to our citizens. New Zealand already produces low emissions food. It makes little sense for us to reduce our supply in favour of higher emissions food production systems elsewhere or for fellow human beings elsewhere in the world to starve. As I said, these issues are genuinely complex. Fast, simple and dumb is not a winning combination when the, con when the consequences are this dramatic. Um, in the processing sector alone, uh, the red meat sector directly employs some 25,000 people, um, and overall the red meat sector supports about 80,000 jobs, mainly in rural New Zealand, supporting the livelihoods of families in rural communities. This is critical to those people um, who, are the backbone of New Zealand. We've talked about the social licence to farm at previous consequences, but the reality is starting to bite now. We are being more assertive in making our case to the public, the media and in Wellington. We're trying to do that in a balanced and sensible way that recognises all the, the realities. The climate change commitment is an important step in asserting a more positive stance to New Zealand and to Wellington. I urge you all to write in support of the commitment in the government's consultation and to be active in advocating on the issues facing the red meat industry. There are a great many opportunities for the sector with rising global demand for natural protein produced sustainably and sold to the world. But the international trade environment also continues to be in flux. Despite strong prices and increasing demand in many countries for safe, high quality meat, Uncertainty in market access challenges remain and indeed in some places have increased. Three years after the UK referendum vote to leave the EU, we're still grappling with what Brexit will look like and how it might impact access to our most valuable sheep meat market. The EU and UK are planning to split, split the New Zealand specific tariff rate quotas for sheep meat and beef post Brexit, which would affect New Zealand's legally binding rights. We remain firm that our legally binding rights must be respected and we're willing to look at creative solutions to achieve this. The ongoing concerns about the future of the WTO, US-China trade tensions and the impacts of African swine fever 
are also impacting the dynamics of global markets. The WTO and its rules-based system is fundamental to the success of small trading nations like New Zealand, particularly given the rise of protectionism globally. We've benefited from the ability to enforce international trade commitments in the past, and we strongly support the efforts of the government to preserve the multilateral, multilateral trading system based on rules and fairness. China is now our largest red meat market, and in May this year, uh, beef exports reached a record volume in a single month. African swine fever has affected pork production and has led to a surge in demand for other meats. And while this is a boom for our exports, many premises are still not listed to supply chilled meat exports. We're continuing to, to invest in the relationship building programs in China to help better position our exports, to help enable exporters to achieve better commercial outcomes, and to support government efforts to maintain and secure additional market access. We've planned several activities later in the year with the aim to help to unlock China for all our meat exporters. So the red meat sector faces a multitude of challenges from uh, on-farm, at the processor level, and in our global markets. It's critical that the sector, being farmers, processors, exporters, our people and our partners, work together as one team. A united red meat sector will give us the greatest chance of being able to deliver the outcomes that we are seeking for everybody and for New Zealand. Thank you very much. I hope uh, during the course of today uh, you uh, uh, enjoy the, the various presentations and I now invite Tony Egan to take the stage to run the next uh, session. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, John, and uh, good morning, everyone. Consumer trends is our topic first up this morning. And my friends, uh, I'm here to tell you that I have taken that um, challenge that that list of problems John mentioned just now very seriously and uh, tried to fulfill one of our most recent consumer trends that's right I've managed to reduce my methane emissions by the required 10 percent I have to confess that um, this has not been easy methane is a gas that's prone to getting out <laughs> and uh, despite considerable effort I, I did go blue in the face I crossed my legs at one stage. I ended up producing a rather large amount of nitrous oxide instead. <laughs> I know why they call it gross emissions now. <laughs> and I can certainly confirm that nitrous oxide is a much bigger problem than methane. <laughs> but the experience did add a little something to another trend I was following, that is my healthy rivers submission and made me realise that it's probably time we stop blaming Rotorua. Even the unions are in on the act. They have come up with a new depletion strategy all of their own. It's called revenue depletion. <laughs> they now want everyone to be paid for putting their gear on and taking it off again. They call it donning and doffing. Perhaps we could work that one into the Taste Pure Nature campaign, Nick. Seems wherever you look these days is a trend emerging or someone coming up with a new bright idea that we're meant to all follow. So it's very fortunate we have with us two experts today, Frederick Leroy and Michael Berger, coming at it from two different angles, uh, are going to give us an insight into consumer trends in today's world. I'd like to welcome to the stage Stu Hall from Ag Research, our gold sponsor, uh, who's going to introduce uh, Frederick. Uh, good morning. Um, firstly, an apology from our Chief Executive Officer, Tom Richardson. Uh, Tom originally had this slot, but unfortunately he's, uh, he's facing quite a significant health issue with an immediate family member. Uh, so I've been rushed in uh, off the bench. Um, before I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our first speaker, I just want to take the opportunity to provide a quick update um, about some things happening in ag research. Firstly, as some of you will be aware, and I know that some in the room have actually contributed, we've recently updated our science plan. Now, our science plan is the document that guides our research capability and will do so for the next five years and beyond. Underpinning that science plan are three extremely relevant, desired strategic outcomes. The first is protected, enhanced, and sustain natural resources. 
The second is prosperous land-based enterprises. And the third is added value food and bio-based products tailored to the future needs of international consumers. I'm very confident that the objectives, and more critically, the capability underpinning these outcomes is extremely well aligned to the future needs of the sector, both in terms of meeting challenges, but also in capitalising on opportunities. Secondly, I wanted to take a minute to update you on two critical capital projects that are coming to fruition. Is Jeff Grant in the room? Is Jeff Grant here as yet? <coughs> These will be dear to, uh, to Jeff's heart. Firstly, the state-of-the-art new containment glass houses on the Grasslands campus in Palmerston North. Uh, these are in the final stages of being commissioned. Why are they important? Because these glass houses, apart from being state-of-the-art, they'll enhance our ongoing work and forage development, both underpinning productivity gains, but also environmental benefit. Secondly, the joint food science facility on the Massey University campus. From early next year, this will house our food science capability in partnership with food science capability from Massey University and the Reddit Institute. Again, the facility features state-of-the-art laboratories and pilot plants to support quality, security, nutritional and provenance verification and assurance. Any story that the industry tells to high-value consumers globally requires verification. Those facilities will also support product development. If you'd like to know more, there's, uh, there's a couple of, well, there's at least one other ag research representative in the room, Vicky Yeoman, our sector account manager. And I'm not sure if, uh, if Cameron Craigie, is Cameron here? A lot of you will know Cameron, but Cameron is our science impact leader from what is a world-class meat science team. So Cameron will be here later in the day. So if you want to know more about those couple of points, um, please come and track us down. We'd love to talk to you.